Okay. That's fine. All right, here we go. Well, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for attending our very first Zoom meeting at uh, here with me. Uh, my name is Brian Prather, and I have been at this store for 14 years, going on 14 years. I've also been birding for about 14 years. And it's one of my passions in life. I actually live it. It's a lifestyle if you want to get that uh, into it. Pretty much self-taught. Um, I have been on the board of directors for St. Louis Audubon Society. I've been on the board of directors for the Wild Bird Rehabilitation. Uh, they're in Overland, Missouri. They take care of sick, injured, orphan songbirds. I've held in my hand pretty much everything that you have seen in your backyard and uh, given them a second chance. Um, and I am currently uh, employed at the Wild Birds Unlimited in Morrison Woods, and we are very dynamic here. And this is part of that uh, uh, dynamic. What I would like to uh, discuss today is a, probably one of the uh, most intriguing uh, subject matters that I could think of, and that is bird identification. And I wanna share with you a passage from this book, which is Sibley's Birding, uh, Birding Basics. And it, it just struck me when I read this, it was just so pertinent. And it said, bird identification in the real world is far, far more than just matching a picture to a bird, 100%. The fact that the living bird is a shy and wary creature with no particular interest in being seen means that the challenge of matching the detail kind of, of the bird's right. appearance to a picture is compounded by the challenge of seeing and interpreting the details in the first place. And that's exactly what we're going to be talking about today. The details that I would like to, to showcase are not only pictures, which I will be showing today as we go along, but a lot of it also is behavior. And depending on the bird species that I present, we will be going into bird behavior, not only socially within their group, but also how they behave in a backyard situation, uh, bird feeding wise. And putting those together allows one a better uh, understanding of at least what species we're looking at. Um, and then hopefully we can discern exactly uh, who the who the bird is. Uh, I misspoke uh, learning what family this this bird is from and then we can pin that down to to species a lot of times especially in a backyard situation. So without further ado this is an American goldfinch and time of year also plays a, an important role as far as the appearance of the bird. I would also say weather uh, plays an important part too. So for instance, today was 60 degrees, and most of the pictures I'll be showing you are birds that are what I would call smooth. Um, last Tuesday, which is unbelievable to me, it was six degrees with eight inches of snow. And these pictures that I'm showing tonight would not look like this last Tuesday, as I'm sure a lot of you can attest. Uh, these birds were fluffed up, they looked like, um, Oh, the Kool-Aid guy, I can't remember his name. <laughs> but, um, you know, he, they were just fluffed, and that's how they stay warm. It, it's, it's their equivalent of George, George Costanza's uh, puffy coat, if you're a Seinfeld fan. And um, that's how they stay warm. But their uh, look, their appearance um, is grossly um, uh, different than what a field guide would, would show you. So without further ado, we're looking at the time of year. This is still winter, although each day is getting brighter out and these guys are starting to uh, sing more and turn a brighter color. And what we're looking at here is an American goldfinch in what is known as basic plumage, but I won't go into technicals like that. I would just say winter plumage. Winter plumage means non-breeding plumage. And Goldfinch are, are some of the birds who actually transform into a much brighter color in the summer. And actually they'll start molting into this color, uh, bright yellow that we're very familiar with, um, starting in March. And in fact, they're doing it now. I had to do a, a double take uh, oh, no. at the store because one was so bright that it really caught my eye. And I thought, wow, holy cow, there you go. 
and usually it's around the throat area that you'll start seeing a brighter patch and sometimes around the head as a whole and it's a piecemeal process so it's not like you snap your finger and and they just become very bright no it's a slow process and it does take six weeks sometimes now we have some numbers here and i'll go through some of them but not all of them um the size of the bird is important in IDing, and what i like to do is use birds that we're familiar with to sort of gauge the size, especially when I'm talking with customers at the store. And oftentimes goldfinch or even chickadee, which I will show later on, is a good size for a small bird. And then we get to a medium sized bird and we can use cardinal or robin. And then we get to something large and we could say crow or maybe one of the larger woodpecker species. And then we kind of narrow it down from there as far as what it looked like, what it was doing. And I'm a big proponent of, of observation. And because these birds do operate uh, specific to species as far as how they play. Wow, it's like I'm on a rock concert. And uh, also how they, um, how they look. So we have right here, this look on number four is what we call a wing bar. And regardless of the time of year for the American goldfinch, that wing bar always is there. And that's very important because on, on first glance, you're thinking, gosh, I think I have a new bird. If you saw the goldfinch say in September when it was bright yellow, and then they leave to forage on natural foods for a while, and then they come back and you see this thing. And you're like, gosh, Brian, what is this? So I wanted to show you some attributes that are always going to be there. And the first one is the uh, wing bar here. This happens to be a single wing bar. The bar in this case is, is the white. What a bar is, is just a broken line um, from the continuation of the color. So you have a, a wing bar, it's just a, it's like sergeant stripes, a wing bar. The second one that I think is very important is the bill. And in this case, the bill never changes regardless of the season. Uh, some birds' bills do change color, which I will go all over uh, in a minute. But nevertheless, the bill shape is the same. So we're looking at a very small bill, very pointed bill. And then we have the overall, what I would call, call the head shape. You just turn your audio yeah. on, I'll turn mine down, I'll listen to yours. Okay. There isn't uh, any um, You're crest, not and we'll go into that too. It's a smooth head, it's a smooth shape all the way around. Conversely, by the end of March, early April, this bird, if it's a male, turns into this. So note right away, the wing bar. And I'll go back to here. So this is the American goldfinch in breeding plumage. Note the bill is the same, nice rounded head. We do have some plumage changes. It's bright yellow, of course, um, but the wing bars stay the same. Uh, the leg colors stay the same. And again, they're uh, a small bird. What about their behaviors? Um, goldfinch have a, a, quite a, a lot of fun behaviors that I enjoy looking at, not only behind the store where we feed. I kind of use the store as a barometer for certain species for our area. And those species would be American goldfinch because they can be finicky sometimes. And also, of course, uh, the ruby-throated hummingbird. I like to keep um, track of them as far as the store goes. That way we can relay information on when they're here or, or what's going on with them. And goldfinch certainly uh, is that way too. Behaviors, a lot of uh, goldfinch are gregarious. Gregarious is a fancy word for saying they like company. They like their own company. They flock heavily together. It's not unusual to have six, 10, 15, sometimes at a feeder. We have experienced that behind the store, believe that or not. Um, you see a group of birds like that, you're able to pick out uh, certain attributes, even though you may not see a single individual clearly. You can still see a wing bar. You can still see, you know, bill shape. You can see what they're foraging on. So this bird is not capable with that thin, pointed bill to crush safflower. Um, it is designed for seed eating. That's all that they do. 
um, but they're small seeds or thin shelled seeds. So obviously the Niger or the Finch blend with our sunflower chips mixed in is perfect for them. And of course the Finch feeders have a very small hole to accompany the small seed that goes in there. They're also capable of doing uh, sunflower seeds in the shell because it is a very thin shell. Um, but the reason people usually feed goldfinch by themselves is it's, this is not a, a blanket statement, um, but it, it, it's truer more often than not, is they don't like a lot of raucous company when they're feeding. They get bumped off the feeders uh, quite regularly. Now they'll bicker amongst themselves, which is normal for a flock, but oftentimes we feed them separately, uh, again, because they don't like a lot of commotion from other species um, uh, muscling in to get to the feeders, especially last week when it was so cold and everything was just rushing to get the feeders. So behavior is very cool. Another neat thing that I enjoy about this species and behaviors is their flight. Their flight is like a sine wave or undulating up and down, up and down, up and down. And they will do that coming to your feeder or leaving the feeder. And oftentimes for if you're outside, especially a, a beautiful, I was gonna say spring day, <laughs> not yet, um, beautiful day like today, you can hear their chip notes as they fly away from you or to you. And uh, that's another thing. So we're looking at three uh, characteristics with your observations. Uh, they're a group feeder. They are going to be a perch type feeder. You're not gonna see them on the ground feeding very often. Um, and then they have that wonderful flight pattern. And they're also gregarious. So that is the American goldfinch. Probably one of the top three birds uh, for our store for people to, to want to get, rightly so. I mean, that is an exotic looking bird for sure. Um, but nevertheless, that is the American goldfinch. Well, I'll, I'll go into questions at the very end. Okay. This is not a white finch. This is just the, uh, again, the winter plumage. It's a very dull olive greenish uh, look to it. But again, you still get those attributes, meaning that that wing bar never changes and that thin bill never changes. Their behaviors usually don't change either until breeding season, but we don't have to worry about that until mid-August through September. They don't even start breeding until then. So there are no babies this, you know, no. It's all about um, the time of year and this look is going to be, we're gonna molt out of this to get to this and that's gonna be fun. That's when you know spring is just right around the corner. All right, speaking of small guys, we're gonna keep with this theme for a minute. This is a black capped chickadee. I have a, another photo of this guy. And again, we have some things to look at here. Unlike the American goldfinch, this bird's plumage doesn't change. It might get a little brighter when they molt, but the overall coloration is the same. So what we have here is half of the head is, is black, black capped, okay? Then we have this beautiful line of demarcation with white uh, flowing into the neck. Kind of forms a triangle there at the cheek. Very thin bill. Don't let that little thin bill fool you though. They're able to crack things that that goldfinch cannot. A nice black throat. And then again, that flows into kind of a nice grayish color here. And then we have some what we call secondary. Secondary is a little technical for you guys. I'm, I apologize for that. Um, I had put this together quite some time ago. Birds have flight feathers and there's 10 um, on each wing. The secondaries when they are perched like this, those secondaries are actually like coverings for the flight feathers because the flight feathers obviously propel them and you don't want those damaged. So here's a nice look again. And wouldn't that be fun to have a, a chickadee feeding on your hand? It can be done, but it takes time. We have right here what they call these bold white edges on the secondaries. Um, chickadees in the St. Louis area will show um, variations in this. And the reason being is 
most field, all field guides will show that we have several uh, chickadees to choose from. We either have the black capped or we have the Carolina. Personally, as a birder, and my birder friends will, will uh, chastise me when I get off here, I know this. Um, I don't really spend too much time in differentiating between Carolina and black capped because St. Louis is on the border where they both uh, exist. They interbreed, they learn each other's songs. So it's like, okay, I'm not gonna be bogged down myself with, is that a black cap or is that a, a Carolina? All I care about for you guys tonight is that we're looking at a chickadee. And chickadees are very gregarious too, um, but in a different way. You may have two or three working together, but you also have them foraging in what we call mixed foraging flocks. And that's especially true in the fall and winter. So they will accompany or other birds will accompany them to your feeders. And when they're at the feeder, a very important thing to watch for is how fast they are. If you see a little gray bird like this with a black cap, you're not really sure who it is. Watch what it does. It goes to your feeder and splits, jumps right off like it just jumped on a hot tin plate. And what it's doing is it is taking seed or a nut and caching it. It's storing and then putting it in between tree bark or in a little cavity hole that they'll use in the, at night. Um, so they're constantly moving back and forth, back and forth. And that's a good um, uh, observation with, with the black cap or the Carolina chickadee. Um, one of the fun things with these birds is, I call them the social butterfly. They seem to not be afraid of too many things. Obviously, a human is, is feeding it. And what I find in the, when I'm out birding in the field is especially during migration, this is really cool. Um, I never dismiss when I see a chickadee as if, oh, you know, there's a chickadee, great. No, I pay attention because there are other uh, migrants coming through in the, in the spring or the fall that follow these guys. And these chickadees are either leading this group in the middle of the group or they're the end of the group. But nevertheless, they are uh, a social butterfly. And it's just a lot of fun to see them uh, interact that way with other species. Unlike some of the other birds like a goldfinch who pretty much keep to themselves. So the black capped chickadee to recap, we have a black head, a line of demarcation of white, okay? It is upright. We'll have another bird coming up here who likes to forage walking down things. We have a nice smooth gray. And again, it's, it's a small bird. It's, it's, a, it's probably a little smaller than, a, than the goldfinch we had previous. And, and again, that's, that's a pretty <clears throat> popular uh, backyard bird. And they can cling, meaning they can grab onto a suet cage or a peanut feeder, or they could be just as happy uh, perching on a perch or a hopper feeder or something like that. So they're um, ambiguous, if you will. <laughs> they can perch or they can cling. Goldfinch do the same. And there's a beautiful shot. Of a, of a nice chickadee there. It has all the attributes that we need. And sometimes this little wash here is a little darker or a little lighter depending. But I would rather not have you pay attention to that, the head, the small bill, and a little bit of gray on the wings. On the wings. All right, now we're gonna go to some big stuff here. And this is everybody's favorite bird. No, I'm sure it's not. Uh, for those of you who don't know, this is the common grackle. And the common grackle is a true blackbird. And I'm gonna give the grackle a little bit of a break here um, because they are in a family, Icteridae, and that includes fun things like Baltimore Oriole, Orchard Oriole, Eastern Meadowlark. So not all blackbirds are, you know, this Godzilla looking thing that uh, can sometimes be the terror of the village. What about the grackle that's attributes that we can look for in the field, backyard or otherwise? This is a large bird. Um, one could say it approaches the size of a blue jay, for instance. They are a rather upright bird. They have a long tail, thick legs, very thick bill, pale eye. That's very important too. 
And then lastly, we have this beautiful, in the sun at least, this purplish blue hue. And it covers about maybe a quarter of the body. And depending on the sunlight, how it hits it, will be the intensity of this blue. Grackles and starlings and the blackbirds, foraging behaviors, their bill is designed to pry things open rather than to crush. Pry things open rather than to crush. Cardinals are meant to crunch. House finch, meant to crunch. These birds can't do that. So as a result, what they do feed on in backyards are what I call soft food items that could include anything without a shell, seed-wise, including peanut pieces, sunflower chips, suet, for sure. They're not necessarily, and suet, if you're not familiar with it, is rendered beef fat that has some goodies mixed in, fruit sometimes, various nuts, mealworms sometimes, things like that. These birds aren't really going for the, the rendered beef fat. They are going for the goodies mixed in. It's a soft food. That's why they tend to raid these, uh, these, those feeders quite readily. And they're one in charge, and most birds are pretty afraid of them, and rightly so. Um, but that, that brilliant eye um, will look right through you. It's quite amazing. But they're, again, a large bird. This is also a bird who is quite gregarious. So now we're going to see you know, quite a few uh, coming to feeders uh, together. They can walk on the ground, which is their natural foraging style, actually, because that bill, again, is designed to pry. So a day like today, the ground is very soft from all the snow melt and the warm weather. They can pry in the ground. You'll see this in your backyards and, and, and poke and pry. They're looking for soft bodied things. Again, the soft uh, uh, bodied things, just like our soft food. So this is, again, a very gregarious bird. Uh, they are a misery nester, so they don't migrate or anything like that. But again, that, that bluish intensity will vary depending on how the sunlight hits it. And uh, again, we're looking at a, a blue J-sized bird. What I would do is look at this tail length, and it's about the length of the body. And that's a great way to differentiate between another species I'll be talking about later called the European starling. And that's, that's, that's just a great way to differentiate. And this is not a crow. People sometimes say we have crow, they have crows in their backyard. Now they may, but they're thinking that this is the crow. Crows are uniform black. They're very thick, they're very tall, but if you're not used to seeing them, we have, again, I, like, I, like, I just love that word, demarcation. There is blue and then there isn't. And so this is a male and that blue or purple crows do not have. And crows do not have an eye that is pale like that. Common grackle. I was in Brownsville, Texas um, back in October releasing some birds for wild bird rehabilitation who uh, needed assistance to get down there because they don't belong up here when it's six degrees and they're insectivores. They didn't have um, European starlings or common grackles down there much. They had something called the great tailed grackle, if you can believe that. It has a tail even huger than this. And again, they're gregarious and they're everywhere. It was quite impressive. But we have the common grackle here. But again, that purplish uh, head is, is, is the giveaway for sure. All right, now, and I, I love jumping around like this because this is how our backyards can be sometimes. You know, things are just flipping, coming, 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 coming. You never know who you're gonna get. So that's kind of how I, how I put this uh, photo, photo package together. So here we have another small gray white bird. First glance, reminiscent of a chickadee. Well, what's the difference? Okay, we don't have that white on the cheek. We don't have that triangle. We don't have that line of demarcation. We have solid. We have a bill who is not stout and black. We have something that's almost flesh colored, pink, if you will. Where the line of demarcation comes into play is the belly. So we have dark on top, white on the bottom, and that white extends all the way to its outer tails. And that's a key mark, which I'll talk about in a second. The bird we have here, again, we talked about time of year, is a winter visitor for Missouri. And this is the dark-eyed junco, slate-colored. 
There are six subspecies of dark-eyed juncos, and we happen to have the slate colored here. So this bird can often be gregarious, or so you possibly have you know six or ten scratching on the ground, and that's the key. These birds are scratchers. What is that? They're like little chickens on the ground. What they do is they this back scratch. And what they do in the wild is they're kicking up things and they back up when they do it so that what they kicked up, they can see. So they'll oftentimes be underneath feeders uh, doing that behavior. And again, they're gregarious. You'll often get a group. Uh, a fun fact with the dark-eyed junco is the female rules the roost in the wintertime. And that's a fun way to kind of see that social dynamic. They can mix uh, they can uh, forage with a mixed group of all uh, of, of other scratchers, sparrows that scratch on the ground, but these guys are pretty gregarious. I mentioned this white on the tail, her tail. When they fly, you can see a flash of that white when they, when they, when they fly away. So if you go out to get your mail or maybe uh, put something in the trash and you see something just bolt out of a bush or or uh, something like that and all you saw was this dark bird with this white on the on the outside of the tail that's your dark-eyed junco in the fall and winter they'll be with us uh through mid-april and they usually arrive around mid-october um so they're a scratcher i like this photo because as you can see there's some snow and if the snow is high enough and it's, it's difficult to find food they will jump or hop on this is, happens to be a tray feeder i have seen photos of them on a on a on a tube feeder which is usually not that common but they the 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 tray feeder allows them to continue to still forage naturally they, they can still scratch on the ground on the on the ground so to speak a platform is nothing but a raised uh ground uh feeder so that's our dark-eyed junco ah my one of my favorite species or families i should say are the woodpeckers and and at first glance you're saying okay brian you have two of the same bird do we left right this is not a photoshop thing um this is actually true there's no funny camera deception this is all true we have two woodpecker species here. How do we know that? Remember in the beginning I said, we want to know what the family is, then perhaps we can go into looking at uh, species specific. So these are woodpeckers because what woodpeckers do naturally is forage and land on vertical surfaces. How do they do this? They're one of a few species whose tail, now I'll have other pictures of woodpeckers that'll simplify this. Their tail is stiff. It's not um, uh, like, like you, it, it'll break, it, it, but it is stiff. And that allows them to brace like a tripod and to uh, go vertically up and down trees. And also our suet feeders, they can cling. Uh, we have a feeder called the tail prep feeder. And that's designed for a resting spot for that bird's tail. So we know we have woodpecker species here just based on that attribute. They have a wonderful tripod. There's the tail there and there's the feet there. And what else are we looking at here? A cursory look, they look the same. We have spots on the wing. We have the white eyebrow. We have some beautiful white on the front. What's going on? Is this a baby and a mom? Uh, no. Uh, this is two different species, and I love this photo because it's so easy to, to comment on it. To the left is our downy woodpecker, and the downy woodpecker um, is our smallest woodpecker species in Missouri. They're here all year. Uh, woodpeckers are cavity nesters, so pretty soon you will hear or see them start making holes in trees to, uh, to have their nest. So what we have here is black and white on the wings white in the front, stiff tail, no other markings on this bird. These happen to be female, and that's a little uh, technical right now, um, only because the red is missing. 
some woodpecker species have red no matter if it's male or female but in the downy world the females lack the red which in the back of the head what else are we looking at here for the downy we have a very small bill everything about the downy is proportioned to its size and it's it's easy for me to say this with a still picture i get that um what i want you to do is do a mental exercise and the tip of this bill if you were to bend it back goes basically just to the tip of the front of the eye conversely this big stout bill which goes together with this big stout woodpecker that tip of that bill is going to go past that eye at least to the back of the eye and <clears throat> that's kind of how i do in the field when i see an individual and that's usually how you will see these guys as individuals um they vertically cling so that's a clue as to family we have a lot of black and white here uh no other colorations nothing going on in the head um that's another clue so now we're looking at downy or hairy and again what i like to do is that head is small the bill is very thin and again it will just touch the front of the eye Another fun uh, fact with these guys is their foraging style um, when they're in the woods and such. You may see this in your backyard. Downy woodpeckers are acrobats. They can uh, land and forage on the thinnest of thin uh, uh, branches or even some of our thicker bushes in our backyards. Yeah, the thing might bend down a little bit, but they're hanging on, they don't care. They are acrobats. The hairy doesn't work that way they need a more substantial limb um like arm thickness limb to to forage on they can forage upside down uh obviously we talk about vertically um they do sometimes go on the ground not always with this species there's another species who does which we'll get to but nevertheless um downy and hairy woodpecker and by the way um we're going to go through a lot here but here at the store, at the Morrison Woods store, um, we want to be like a, uh, when it comes to bird identification, I always feel like you need a mentor. And, and we would like to be your mentor for that. Uh, we feel it's very important. Um, you can always bring us photos or videos, pictures on your phone. Just, just keep that in mind. And because and, um, we're coming into some exciting things with transition wise with birds. And uh, just, just always remember that. We, we want to be your, your mentor for sure. So don't think that once this program is over, that's it. No, I do this every day. This is my favorite part of the job, to be honest with you. And again, we have a couple more downy facts here on that long chisel beak and that very thin uh, short bill. All right, here we go. This is a small bird maybe a little larger than American goldfinch. And we have some attributes here that we have a lot going on here in this head. Brown cap, line of demarcation with black, and then a white cheek. We have this black circle here, that's interesting, and a black throat. And the overall is brown back. And what we're looking at here is a sparrow. It's not a true sparrow, which they wouldn't be called sparrows. They give the, they give the true sparrows a, a bad name. This is a St. Louis specialty, however, so location can play a part in this species whereabouts. This is the Eurasian tree sparrow. In the birding world, we call them ETs, Eurasian tree sparrow. And they were released, I believe, at a 1904 World's Fair in St. Louis. And they really have too much of their range. So if Columbia, Missouri sees one, and they do on occasion, that's a big deal over there. Uh, they do get into Illinois a little bit, and a little bit further north but they pretty hold tight to uh, Missouri and the surrounding 50 mile square uh, circle. What, what differentiates this bird from its cousin, the house sparrow, is a brown head, this is the male, and that, I call it a dimple, but it's a uh, black circle. It's a, it's a black uh, circle on its cheek. These are cavity nesters. They're often, they're very gregarious, very gregarious. You can have 15, 20 of these guys uh, come into feeders or or roosting in a, in a hedgerow, very chatty too. Um, again, about the size of a, uh, a goldfinch, or a little bit thicker than that. Um, cavity nester, um, 
pretty good, uh, pretty omnivorous. They can crunch almost anything. Safflower does slow them down. I don't hear a lot or see a lot of them on suets, and they don't do uh, finch feeders too often unless times are really tough and they'll they'll go to anything. Um, they're tough little guys though. Okay, here's the other nemesis bird that we've been hearing about for about six weeks now, two months easily. This is the European starling. This is a non-native species, just throwing it out there. So what we got here is, we have a lot going on. This is its uh, winter plumage. Blackbirds in general, even though it's not a true blackbird, they molt in the fall. So they're very bright in the fall and winter. And eventually this will fade away and they get a solid black body with a very sharp pointed bill that does not, is not dark anymore, but will be yellow. And I should have a photo of that later on. So what we have here is a russet potato sized bird, a uh, very short squatty tail. It's just a short squatty bird. Um, and it's nothing going on crest wise, just a rounded head, but very spotty. When I hear people say iridescence or spotty, and there's variations with this as the, years, as the year progresses. Again, it, this eventually wears off and it becomes solid black. Uh, hordes, gregarious, you, you, you can get 50 of them easily. Um, they have that murmuration in the sky. You're driving on Highway 40 and you hit the 270 exit and you just see this black ball just, just doing all this. That's the starlings. That, that's, that's a murmuration. It's, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty uh, amazing to see. Not amazing to see it at, at feeders, unfortunately. Their bill is designed to pry things open, not to crush. So they do soft food things. Again, we talked about that with the grackle the uh, 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 suets and, and things without a shell. Um, and they're, they're pretty loud and, and I don't wanna say they're mean, but they, they're aggressive, I'll put it that way. Um, but that is the European starling. Here is the European starling in uh, summer plumage. We're already starting to see that yellow bill, so look for that. It's gonna be the only blackbird with the yellow bill. Note the dark eye, is that pale? like the eye of the grackle. And again, this kind of has a purplish uh, iridescence around the head and neck. Um, the, this bird just took a bath and it's shaking it off. That's why you have the feathers kind of look like a, uh, I don't know what you would call that, but um, a uh, Henry VIII neck piece maybe. <laughs> but uh, anyway, it's um, again, that potato uh, uh, size bird with tail. Another species that often gets confused with sparrows are the house finch, and this happens to be a female. And what we have here is no facial pattern, and that's important for a reason. A nice cardinal style bill here. So this is a cruncher. And then we have a nice striped pattern on the, the front. In the background is the male, and I'll have a better picture of him in a minute. These guys are very gregarious. So you're gonna have male and female together. Makes IDing uh, much easier. And this, a lot of folks want to turn this bird into another bird, its cousin, the purple finch. We'll differentiate that in a second. But nevertheless, this is the male, or excuse me, this is the female with that nice cruncher bill and pretty much just a nice brown. Uh, fun fact with these guys, safflower is a favorite of theirs. They're, they're meant to crunch. Uh, they don't do thistle too often because their bill is a little too thick for that. Uh, they don't do suet very often either. Uh, they are one of the first songbirds to nest in uh, St. Louis, so uh, kind of watch for that. They love to the nest in a wreath hanging on your door. So FYI, if you have a wreath nesting or hanging on your door still, you may want to think about removing it unless you want a cool, neat thing for your family to observe. House finches are, are really fun to watch grow up for sure. Blue eggs. Okay, we did Goldilocks already. I'm sorry about that. Okay. Again, the house finch male, red, bright red. It could, it could be a, I've heard of customers say there's a stripe down his back. Yeah, when the wings are open, you could see red down there. But what's really important is the red stops, but we have this heavy streaking. And that's important to differentiate that between the uh, purple finch. The purple finch does not have heavy streaking at all. In fact, the purple finch will never be this red. 
it's almost like a raspberry color. And again, the female, uh, no head pattern, and that's important. And again, the nice uh, striping there. And again, gregarious, a fun songster, a beautiful bird to have in a backyard on a cold winter's day for sure, or any time of the year really. Now we have the house sparrow. House sparrow, gray cap, not the brown. No, no uh, patch here, this is the male. Black throat, but again, that gray cap is, is really the, uh, the key there. And um, very gregarious. I know that a lot of you guys know what that bird is, the house sparrow for sure. Um, again, very gregarious, eats pretty much anything. Um, they are a cavity nester. And so um, watch out for that if you have a, a, a chickadee house or a bluebird box house out right now. Uh, you may want to watch for um, activity in, in there from them. Male and female dark-eyed juncos again. Um, just, a, just a beautiful scratcher, beautiful winter plumage. And speaking of plumage, uh, sometimes you get a fleeting glimpse. I love fleeting glimpses and uh, my shutter speed was not high enough for this one, but that's okay. Red on the back of the head, red on, on, on heads, um, that's, that's a patch, is usually indicative of probably a woodpecker species. A um, lot of yellow here, this white Peter Cottontail patch here. This is a northern flicker. They're a blue jay sized bird. And I believe I have some other photos of this guy. Yes. Note the stiff, the, the, the stiff tail feathers. That's how they that's how they roll. Red on the back of the head, females and males have that. But look at the beautiful browns and grays and a little spottiness and the spottiness I got it. down here. Um, big thick bill, meant crunching or uh, uh, excavating. It gets its name, flicker. In this case, see how the grass and the um, uh, concrete kind of mix? Well, guess what's in between those cracks in the spring and summer? Ants. And this bird loves to flick with its tongue. Its tongue is longer than its bill, as in all woodpeckers. They love to flick for ants and other insects like that. So it gets its name, uh, flicker from the, the behavior there. Backyard wise, they love to do sunflower chips. Uh, they will do suet and sometimes peanut pieces and it is a vertical feeder. And again, in flight, they're so powerful, but that white patch at the base of their tail is a field marker, that's what you see. And this is the uh, yellow shafted Northern Flicker and underneath its wings and underneath its tail would be this beautiful bright yellow bordered with uh, black. N uh, not a very common bird sometimes for people's backyards. They can be a little social too sometimes. Sometimes you'll have two, uh, but oftentimes they're just one. But they're always a hit for customers when, they, when you see them. And again, here's some nice attributes of a front. They have a, a triangular black patch here, spotty chest, and uh, that stiff tail. Uh, just, just a beautiful bird. Um, I'm going to skip through these. We're getting, I didn't realize we're getting kind of kind of uh, close on time. But again, I just want to exemplify the woodpeckers in general. What we have here are the pileated woodpeckers. They're the size of a crow. You have to be in some woods, uh, deep woods, to kind of get these guys. Um, Innsbruck has them. Uh, some places that buttress up to Creep Corp Park have them. They're crow size. There's really nothing that you can huh, match this up with other than pileated or pileated. And I have a fun story about how I pronounce it. Next time you're at the store, I'll show that with you. Purple finch. Uh, see on the side here where the house finch was very brown and stripy. This is very thin and it's almost, it almost carries the color of the, of, the, of the purple, but really raspberry. But see that facial pattern there. And that's gonna be exemplified with the females. She's gonna have white around her face. So when I say these guys are gregarious, it's very simple to see if you have a female with the purple finch or a female with the house finch because her facial pattern will not, will not show up. So here's the house finch here and see that it's just a, it's just a purple. It's, it's, it's just a, I can't explain it other than a picture speaks a thousand words. 
Um, winter visitor for us though. So that does uh, say a lot. So April, we're pretty much not gonna see them. And here is the female purple finch. And again, that, and it, it, I can't stress this enough how bright this facial pattern is, especially that white eyebrow. Uh, it's the only finch that has that. And once you see that, it's like, okay, there's no reason to try to force a bird into saying this is this or this is this. You know, once you see it, it's very simple to, to really identify. We talked about the red-bellied woodpe woodpecker earlier. I'm just kind of going through some things. Um, let's see. Oh, my favorite photo, too. Now, this is Photoshopped. Forgive me for that, but there's only a way to do it. Um, oftentimes, I get people who have red bellies on the right versus red-headed on the left. Red-headed is, there is, it, it's, it's like velvet. It's all red, the only red head in the woodpecker kingdom. And we also have a nice line of demarcation here of white and then black and then a nice wing, white wing patch here. Uh, habitat plays a crucial role into where one may see these. They're not a very thick, thick wood bird uh, like a woodpecker, other woodpecker species are. Um, they have a, an ability to actually catch insects in the air. They will do peanuts, uh, they will do suet, but for this uh, class, we're going to look at how do we tell the difference? Well, first we, on the right, we have this beautiful zebra pattern, and man, in this, in this bright sun like today, oh my gosh, it is absolutely gorgeous. That zebra pattern is how I like to describe that, black and white here, salad with salad, black salad, white salad. And then it gets its name, the red belly, Birds were na were named in the field. They were in the they were named in the hand. I won't tell you how they got the, them in the hand, but they were named for having them in their hand. So when they turn the bird over, in this case, the red-bellied woodpecker, it's a reddish hue. It's not bright red like its head. It's just a it's just a blush. It's just a rosy blush, if you will. But um, it has a mohawk. You know, this this orange is not all the way around its head. There's a tremendous amount of white on the sides, but it it, it is just a mohawk. And in fact, that's how I describe this bird. I say, oh, you have the orange mohawk. Uh, just to differentiate the red head, uh, mohawk is just part of the head. And that's kind of how I try to instill bird IDs to people at the store, especially, or folks, or folks I go birding with, that you know you come up with these nicknames and it's gonna help you. Oh, more starlings, that's the, and I think I'll end it with this one, the tufted titmouse. Tufted titmouse are, they have, not to anthropomorphize, but they have such an expression on their face. They look like they're always happy. They, look like they just have a ball. And it gets its name, Tufted Titmouse, because of the tuft. Northern Cardinals had that tuft. And like Cardinals, they can lower or raise it. So what are we looking at here? Black on the face, no, nothing like that. It's pretty much gray with some white on its breast, a little bit of brown, sometimes it's a peach color, a little short bill. Dark eye with a black eye line and makes her eye look larger than what it is. And that little tuft, um, Peter, Peter, Peter is their call. They'll, they'll do that four or five times in a row, sometimes three. The reason I'm saying that is because they're singing right now, not now, but that I've heard them today or I'm gonna hear them tomorrow behind the store. Peter, Peter, Peter. They are another casher. They're another hit and miss, boom, boom, boom. They don't stop at the feeder for long. Um, unless they're kind of getting bold, and they'll pick, and they'll pick the, the prime peanut. They may pick up two or three at once or at a time and then pick the one that's the fattest. Um, another social butterfly, the tufted titmouse. And that little tuft, it's so cute, is, uh, is how it gets its name. Um, I think I've rambled on long, long enough. This is actually a lot of fun for me, <laughs> but unfortunately it, it's getting to be about an hour or so. I promised some questions and uh, we will certainly do that now. And again, any of this stuff, come to the store and we'll talk more for sure. What, what do I do? Okay, I don't know how to do that. Okay. 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 <laughs> okay. I love this question. It said, I had, a, I had a white finch last week. He was pure white where the house finch has a red color. Um, 
I didn't go into this today because I was asked from customers, from you guys, this winter than I can remember of what I'm about to say. And if you have a pen and paper, you'll have to write this down. Um, and you've all heard of albino. Albino, there's no color, there's no pigment, pigment. Eyes are pink, pink bill is pink, and birds now. Bill is pink, uh, feet are pink, and then the bird is this ghostly white. Uh, there's no, no color. What I have seen and what I personally saw at Creepcore Park two weeks ago, I put that on my personal Facebook page, um, was something that is partially white. Maybe it's one feather, maybe it's the head, maybe it's half the body, but the eyes or the bill or the feet still have color and there's still color in, in the bird. And Peterson, Roger Troy Peterson in his field guide has, if you, any, any of you guys have this, it's really cool. It, it has a, a black and white birds and it's outlined, just, just black. You know, it, 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 it's, it's, it's like silhouette. And it's training you to figure out what bird this is just based on the silhouette of this bird, the shape of the bird, right? Well, getting back to this, um, there's, a, there's a, a phenomenon called leucism, leucistic, and I will spell that to the best I can. Uh, L-E-U-C-I-S-T-I-C, -I -I leucistic. And what that is, is a, I believe it's a recessive gene that just gets kicked on, perhaps, um, who knows. Um, but nevertheless, every species can have this, and I've seen them all, almost, at Wild Bird Rehab or out in the field. And from you guys with your wonderful pictures, which we, we love at the store. Uh, leucistic is, is again, you're gonna be missing colors. So today's topic, what I really wanted to re reiterate was, it's not always about matching the bird to the photo of your field guide. Now, obviously that's gonna help you 99.9% .9 of the time, but there's other things that the book will not show you, such as leucistic, but you have the overall shape of the bird, the habit of the bird, um, the foraging style of the bird, does it make a sound when it's flying or whatever? And it's like, oh my gosh, that is this bird. If I can transpose what I'm seeing into the field guide. Perfect example, we had a customer about 10 days ago with a leucistic robin and it was in the snow. And it was, you know, it was like an Arctic fox in, 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 in an Arctic tundra with the, with the white. It was just unbelievable, but it had those characteristics of what a robin looks like. You know what I mean? The thicker breast, the beautiful rounded head, the stature, the, the posture of it, the foraging styles on the ground. Um, that's a great question. Leucistic um, is, is, is a great, uh, that's a wonderful topic for another, um, another day for sure. I'm having trouble getting some more. Is there, is there a way for you to share these slides so I can go back and look again later? Yeah, we're going to, we're gonna we'll probably be working on that. Um, uh, yeah, please stay up to date on, on our Facebook page. Um, it's, it's so dynamic and, and Lisa does just a fantastic job with it. I can't uh, believe half the stuff that she comes up with, which is just so pertinent to what we're saying at the store. And I go to the Facebook page, like, oh my gosh, we just talked about that and she had no idea. It's, it's awesome. Um, one last question, I suppose, and again, questions like this, we answer all the time at the store. That's my favorite part, interacting with you guys. And thank you for, for being this long with me. Um, I lost track of time, because again, I'm having a blast. <laughs> are the starlings always brownish in the winter? No, they are that, that iridescent color um, that will eventually uh, wash out or, or rub off to be black. And I think we had them the past couple of weeks, but they looked more like your summer photos. Again, February, even though, the it's still winter and the calendar year says winter it's all about transition remember the goldfinch from the very first photo it's a piecemeal process and the bill being bright yellow or getting yellow but still speckly on the starling it's a piecemeal process that and, and, and you're not seeing the same individual every day necessarily too so you may have another individual who has a dark bill still you know what i mean that's the beauty of this and especially right now you may have a uh, whatever, 
it's it's a, it's a piecemeal process. But if it's a russet potato look, and if it's a short stubby tail, and it's you know has a whole bunch of friends with it, and they're all hollering and being mean, then you have your starling, regardless if it's exactly what it looks like in the book, for sure. Um, thank you so much for for being here. This is my first one, and I, I hope it was uh, uh, good for you guys. I I enjoyed it. <laughs> I had a whole bunch of fun. But um, uh, please come visit the store. Like I say, we want to be your mentors. I wish I would have had a mentor when I first started.